Okay, so before we get into this Tax Stone podcast, I just have to shout out our sponsor for this episode. This episode is sponsored by at HII Effect. That's high effect. Those are our boys uh, who make the 2020 knockout pre-rolls, which are very, very popular around here at the OSS store. Uh, they've been hooking us up. You might have seen me rocking the 2020 tees as well. Those are pretty dope. Uh, we're also a big fan of their their product that's called 2020 Mud, M-U-D-D. It's uh, some intense stuff. You should definitely check out their website, H-I-I Effect, E-F-F-E-C-T dot com. And make sure that you follow H-I-I Effect on Instagram as well. Uh, our co-host on this episode, TK, a.k.a. TK Ali Kimbro on Instagram. He's also the co-host on this episode, and he is a big part of the 2020 brand. So shout out to him for hooking the sponsorship up. And without a doubt, here we go. This is the Tax Stone episode. Let's go. No Jumper, coolest podcast in the world. I'm Adam22, and we're here today with my favorite podcaster, Tax Stone. What the fuck is up, beloved? What's shaking, beloved? How are you? I'm so happy and just blown away to have you in the studio today. I can't believe it. Yeah, man. I had to pull up, man. People have been telling me about your podcast for the longest. And I know you don't really fuck with people, so I'm very uh, you know, thankful that you've even given us a shot. i got to give a, a shout-out to my man TK here for getting you in the booth with me. Yeah, you know, I don't fuck with too many humans. You know what I mean? <laughs> I like dogs. Yeah. You know what I mean? I like birds. You like cats? Like that. Not really cats. Cats are very sneaky. Yeah. So, like, I'm like, I'm kind of scared of cats. I always get scratched by a cat out of nowhere when I least expect it. So, I'm a little afraid of cats. You ever have an experience where it, like, jumped out? I hear, like, little kids talking about, like, a little a cat jumped out and grabbed them by the face or some shit. Well, not, not on the face, but they didn't jump out on me enough. Uh, my man, Cat Raheem, man, his, I used to go over there, rest in peace, and smoke. He just died. That cat used to scratch me every time I came over. Right. I was like, yo, I was like, damn, did I steal something? Like, what the fuck is it? Like, right. he just didn't like me for shit. <laughs> well, my cat's from Brooklyn, so I feel like you guys might get along. Yeah, I might have seen him on a loaf of bread before. <laughs> yo, all right, so you might have hooked him up with a can of tuna before. Uh, yo, so for the people who don't know, who aren't familiar with Tech Stone, give us a little tiny bit of background info. You're from uh, East New York? Yeah, I'm from East New York, Brooklyn. Which, for those who don't know, is, is the grimiest part of Brooklyn, true or false? Yeah, I hear that occasionally. It's hard to come up out there. <laughs> <laughs> and you had a hard time coming up out there. You did a lot of crazy-ass shit throughout your life before you became a successful podcaster. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was, um, I was um, um, a child that was into a lot of different things. You right. know what I mean? I definitely. Cause it was, even when I was doing bad things, I was like doing like good things, too. Like It was always weird. I think I had too much time on my hands. Mm-hmm. So it was like, yeah, I got into a little bullshit. But growing you, up. did you have a good family life growing up? Like, what was your mom's dad like? Yeah, my mom, um, my mom, my mom, my family life was always good. I'm a crack baby, but my family life was always good. Like, I never was. It was never no. I never wanted for nothing. I never was really neglected. Like, I think because I grew up around a lot of family and stuff like that, and we never really, I, we never really wanted for money too much. You know right. what I mean? We was always all right. So I think that that helped, especially when you're in the hood and it's like other poverty going on because it was like people that didn't have shit that I had and that's when I guess I started really noticing that my life was okay because I'm like, right. it was like minor shit that I looked at and didn't even really appreciate and people didn't have it. Right. So. But when did you start breaking the law? Um, probably, I don't know, pro- young. Young, probably, um, probably before junior high. I probably was still in elementary. Um, I always say I think that's because I was. Um, my mother taught me too young. Right. She taught me like I was sharp in math for like all the subjects. So when I was in school, I used to be bored as hell. Right. Because I would run through whatever test they give in ten minutes. I used to do people homework. One of my homegirls is a doctor now. Hit me on Facebook not too long ago and was like, "Tax, remember when you used to do my homework?" Really. And it's mad funny because it's like I used I tell the story to people like, "Yeah, I used to do people homework sometimes. Like three, four people. Like, come on, let me do it. Just because I wanted people to hang out with after school." And I was bored, like, I'll do your homework right now, you know what I mean? I'd do it right here in the class. So you feel like you were, like, smart, and that made you feel like an outsider as a kid, kind of? Nah, it left me as an outsider, because when everybody else was busy trying to figure out the problems, I was done. Right. So I had nothing to do. 
So, you know, when you got too much time on your hands as a kid, you start creating mischief, you know what I mean? Right. That's when kids get hurt. Like, it's like the parents that, you know, um, I'm not advocating for it or not. It's like parents that leave kids at home alone. Right. And they think that they just going to sit in the corner because they watching their favorite movie or some shit. But when that <laughs> movie is over, you know, whatever the fuck is done, the attention is they start getting into shit. They right. start getting mischievous. And I think that's basically what happened with me. But you got no kids, right? No. If you did have kids, how do you think that you would raise them? Um, I would raise them the way I raised my little brother. Uh huh. You know what I mean? Like I always tell people, like I already lived my life because my little, my only goal was to really make sure my little brother wasn't like me. Really? You know what I mean? So and you feel like you came out that bad? Why? Just because you went to jail and and all this shit? My everything. Like, I put my I put my mother through a lot as a, as a child. I put my um my family through a lot and, and the thing is that I, I was smart enough not to do that right. but I still did it that, and, yeah that's the interesting thing about you is that you're, you're, you clearly are like a smart ass dude who just went for it anyway and, and did a lot of the bullshit that other people were doing but maybe did it to a larger degree because you were smarter yeah and you know what it is um, sometimes it's, um, having too much heart and not enough smarts mm. could be suicide right. and, and vice versa you know what I mean? So you always want a balance of, you know, or somebody around this balance that could be like, yo, listen, my nigga, like, you need to relax or whatever it might be. And it took me years to get to that point to where I just realized and be like, yo, you got to check yourself. Right. You know what I mean? So when did you join a gang? What, what, is that an early on uh, step in this whole process? Yeah, um, probably like it was in junior high school, junior right. high school, 1998. Okay, 98. So how old are you right now? Um, 30, 31. Okay. I'll be 31 this year. I'm um, 32, so we're on about the same level. That's interesting. Yeah. So, um, when did you, uh, when did you first get locked up? Um, probably around that same year or, or the next, maybe in eighth grade. I think I caught my first, my first charge. What was that charge? Um, attempted murder or some shit. Oh shit. Really? But it wasn't that type of thing. Like it was some kid that I grew up with and, um, he was, I think it was some shit over some weed or something. I didn't pay him in time. And he was like, he was like a kid that just got his weight up in the hood. So he was like, yo, when I see tax and he tried to hit me with a, um, I don't know exactly what you call them shits, but like the shit that people like climb mountains with, they stick in the, Oh, in what the, the fuck do you have one of them for? He just had one handy <laughs> and he tried to hit me with it and it dropped. And then I hit him with the shit. Right. Yeah. So that was like. What happened when I was a kid, and then I stayed out of trouble for a little while, and then out of nowhere, I just, like, kept getting in trouble, you know what I mean? Like, it was just a fucking phase in my life where I couldn't stop getting in trouble. Yeah. Were you When you got out of jail the most recent time, were you, like, on, on a mission to stay out? Yeah, yeah, because it just, that last time is, well, even before then, like, I was never really planning on going back to jail, and I was, like, actually taking all the steps to stay out of jail. Right. So... When I when I went back, it was just like a it was like a mental beat down. Right. I never cried going to jail before or getting in trouble, but that time I wanted to cry. Uh -huh. Like I was trying to fight a cry out of me because I'm like, damn, like I'm doing well for myself. You know what I mean? Right. So when I when I went to jail, it was basically it was a parole violation, and I, and I uh, my last parole violation or whatever, and I got out. But I was doing so well for myself, it just was like, damn man, I, I fucking just took a year away from my life again. Right. You know what I mean? Fucking with this dumbass parole shit. So ever since then, I just was like on a mission to not be in prison. You know what I mean? Like I'm not going to jail. Like, I'm not doing nothing to go to jail. I don't want to be a part of nothing to go to jail. I'm not hanging around motherfuckers to go to jail. You know what I mean? Did, so, did you realize the podcast was such a big opportunity early on? Like who who put you onto the idea of it? Um, Kid Fury from right. the Reed Podcast. He was the first one that was like, "Yo, tax, yo, you gotta fuck with podcasting. You're a funny dude." But how do you even know about you from Twitter and shit? Nah, I knew about Kid Fury um because my homegirl manages. In. Okay. So I was I used to go. She used to be like, "Yo, come to this event I'm having or this live show," and I didn't know what the shit was about. And then I seen him sell like 700 tickets or some shit, like for a live podcast. And I'm like, "Damn, I don't even know what the fuck a podcast is, but yeah. he's selling 700 tickets for a live podcast." Right. <laughs> I'm like, but did it just occur to you right away when you saw like his podcast? You're like, "Yo, I could do this. Like, this is actually something that I'm naturally nah, suited I, to." I, I thought that I could do it because like I was doing like um, internet radio right. at the time with my son Skeeton Extra. 
Oh, um, okay. You just like co-hosting or something? Yeah, shit? I was yeah. like, I used to come on. It was called 10 Minutes with Tack Stone. Okay. And them 10 minutes that I used to come on, people used to write all day. Like, I can't wait for Tax to come. Sometimes I would miss it, not come on. Right. And people would be pissed off. Yeah. So that's when I knew people like to hear me talk or whatever. And I, I just always, I had it in consideration. Charlemagne bought me on Brand Idiots. And that's when he was like, yo, man, you got to get your own podcast. And then it went from there. Yeah. Well, do you have a, what was your podcast format like early on? Like, who, what kind of guests were you doing? And were you, were you surprised? Did you change it up along the way? Because you have a mad variety now. Nah, I never really changed it. I always wanted it to be a variety of guests because I never wanted it to be a hip hop podcast because right. people knew me for um, my strong opinions mm -hmm. on hip hop and, and music or whatever. And. I didn't really want to get into that space of always having to interview hip hop artists because I say a lot of things about hip hop artists that they might not like. And the thing is, is that I might not even fully be saying it from a hateful standpoint. It's just from me seeing what I'm seeing, you know what I mean? And I knew that I wouldn't be able to land a lot of interviews with hip hop artists because somebody from their camp or whoever would be like, nah, we don't fuck with him. You know what I mean? Right. And you're not interested in playing that game of fucking watching what you say, huh? Clearly, nah, 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 clearly nah, nah, nah. not interested in that. <laughs> nah, because you gotta, you gotta, you gotta live your life liberation. You know what I mean? You right. gotta be free. You can't be living in a mental cage or having people cage you. And that's what happens a lot of times with people when they deal with what what's going on with society. Right. You know what I mean? Like I've been like an advocate. I've been telling people like about gay people like for like the the last year. Telling like, people what? Like like I like when gay people are just gay and they out and they, they having fun and they just being who they are. Cause you be, it's like why are you not? Right. If that's who you are. Exactly. Like, yeah, yeah. You're supposed to be free. You're not supposed to be hiding yourself for this person right, right here. I'm not hiding myself for nobody. So Was that I, a transformation for you? Uh, were you homophobic when you were younger and you got over it? Yeah. Yeah. Because it's like how we raised, you know, from everything, from games like pause to no homo. Right. Like I had to catch myself from saying that. I'm like, why the fuck I keep telling somebody I'm not gay every other second. <laughs> yeah, you know yeah, what yeah. I mean? Like, no homo, though. I hit, so, him, I hit you with a pause right around May because I said that you were uh, in better shape than I thought you were going to be. Oh. Uh, Which is like, yeah, but, I felt kind of weird. I was like, oh, pause, pause. Nah, it's not, that's not a pause, though. You know yeah, what I mean? Because yeah. it's like, I know you don't mean that you want to have sex with me. Right, yeah. Like, why, why, <laughs> but you make yourself sound kind of weird by having to bring up the no homo thing all the time. But we all did that. When nah, we, we did it, yeah. I don't know but why. It's but. like, when you become a grown man yeah. and stuff like that, and you think about it, and like, I got gay friends, and mm -hmm. I got people, gay associates, I do business with and if I say pause or no homo I might be truly offending them and mm -hmm. it's like I'm not trying to offend you I don't got no issue with you yeah. so if I could take that little bit of shit out my speech just to make people comfortable I'll do it you know yeah. what I mean so that's just basically a part of everything because I feel like that's probably like the biggest prison that people be in is their sexuality right. because of what society might say about it I remember when, 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 when what was the dude Caitlyn Jenner yeah 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 this Bruce, dude, Bruce to Caitlin, yeah, Bruce, yeah. when he first did that, I was like, I was like, kind of like, what the fuck? But at the same time, I had to accept it and say, man, let that man be who he want to be. Exactly. Because yeah. that's who he wants to be. Right. Don't fight him to be something else that he don't want to be. Right. And I think that's what's wrong with society today. They try to put you in this little box and tell you you're supposed to be like this or you're supposed to be like that. And that's just not how the world works. Because you're a dude who's making a bunch of money and making a name for himself by just 100% going out there and being yourself. There might yeah. be a microphone in front of you but you just that's just you it's the same as you sitting on the couch talking to your homies right More yeah or less. I always tell people that like I never expected my friends to listen to tax season right. because I was like these motherfuckers hear tax season every day <laughs> yeah, exactly yeah 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 I don't expect the motherfuckers to listen I to that shit I don't think many of my close close friends because it's, it's like what I say on the podcast is usually me reiterating my crazy opinions that I'm saying all the time in real exactly. life so it's like do, you, do most of your good friends watch the podcast you think yeah here and there mm-hmm here and there, but not my real close friends because it's me. They knew me for so long. It's like... Yeah, but you know, they'll just call me. You're not like a podcast <laughs> listener, though, right? Do you listen to anybody? Not not much. Right. Like, um, I got a short attention span. Right. So, like, that's why I think I like Twitter so much because right. it's like an instant thing. Like, I say something, I instantly get a response, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. All that other stuff, like, the content, that's why I appreciate people that do listen to my podcasts. I be like, yo, man, there's people out there that can listen to you talk for an hour and a half. And I can't listen to people, especially, I can't listen to annoying voices. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I can't listen to people that's not witty enough. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, you need some wit. 
Exactly. There's a lot of witless people out there with podcasts right now. That's I why I don't know how people it's listen. It's an honor when people watch your podcast because there's mad other podcasts that are like relatively similar. They might have some of the same guests and everything, but it's like, yo, you consistently give me an hour of your time. It's like, that's that's a big deal in yeah. this day and age. Motherfuckers don't really like want to sit there and watch that when like a rap video is three minutes. You could look at your Twitter for, for an, if you look at your Twitter for an hour, you could look through everything that everybody said in the whole last 48 yeah. hours, whatever, you know? So it, yeah, it's a real honor. Yeah, definitely. But uh, were you going hard on Twitter before the podcast? Was it, were you concerned with promoting yourself via social media, really? Um, you know what? I knew I was doing a podcast for a long time. Nobody else knew. Uh -huh. So what I was basically doing was building myself up on social media. Right. Because I wanted to, like, I wanted to start off with a bang. Yeah. And that's, like, kind of what happened. Like, my first episode got, like, 40,000 listens. Really? Yeah. First one. Holy in, shit. like, a couple of days, like, three days. Yeah. So, like, from there, like, everybody, like, that was involved was like, yo, man, I don't know. I think your podcast is going to be a hit. Right. I don't know. Like, but I knew it had something to do with me just having my following up already. Right. And that's a part of what I wanted to do. I just didn't want to start off on a small scale. Right. I'm like, yo, man, I really want to do this shit. And I want to I wanna bust some moves in this shit. But you have to think think about like, certain things that you say on on the line like you got to think about the fact that it's gonna be controversial but do you ever perceive it that way beforehand like oh if i say this shit about tupac or whoever then i'm yeah, gonna you know what i'm gonna I get some attention i, I didn't really know i didn't know that that tupac shit was as serious as it was until i said it uh -huh. but i thought that men and like-minded people that understood where I was coming from would understand where I was coming from. Because just like I said, people think that I hate Tupac. And it's like, I don't hate no fucking Tupac. Mm -hmm. I was just stating something wrong that he did within his career. Can you reiterate for the people who don't know what your complaint was about him? All right. Um, this is how the shit started. Someone on Twitter um, came up with a scenario where somebody snitched at a job or some shit. Right. And they, like, offered information. And basically, I was like, yo, Tupac did the same thing. Right. So they was like, what? What do you mean? And I explained it on Twitter, like, tweeted it out. Right. And, you know, pe it was people that agreed. It was people that disagreed. But it was, like, most the people that, like, really disagreed was, like, Stone Cold Pac fans. Right. And it was like, my nigga, you can still be a Pac fan and understand that, yo, the nigga did this wrong here or whatever it might be. But what, what did he do exactly, in your opinion? Um, I told him he snitched. Right. Because he offered information. Uh, like, for instance, like, if if I um, do anything to you right now and you say to the cops, like, you don't, you, you tell them, I don't know who did it, but then you announce on the news somewhere else or on a song and you say, yeah, the niggas that shot me right. had Beloved shirts on. And meanwhile, it's only four dudes that wear Beloved shirts. Yeah. You're going to start looking in that direction. So it was the same thing that I said about Cameron. I was like, Cameron got shot in D.C. And he said, I seen them shots go off when the rock sign went up. And I said, listen, initially, me being a Cameron fan, when I heard Cam got shot in D.C., I was like, maybe he got shot in D.C. because they don't like Harlem niggas, they don't like New York niggas, and he played Alpo in the movie. Right. D.C. niggas probably just was like, we shooting this motherfucker. <laughs> but when he said, I seen the rock sign go up when them shots went off, you just moved the whole investigation from D.C. to Manhattan. But I don't get what, when he said that, I never knew what the fuck to think of it, because... That's what I, well, I thought of it, like, you felt like somebody from the rock got you shot or shot you. Right. And that would be what the uh, cop or investigator would think if you said something like that. They would be like, oh, let me go investigate investigate um, Rockefeller. Right. Because this is what Cameron said. So that's what I was trying to say. So people took it so far and out of context they was coming at me and Biggie and fuck Biggie and I'm like nigga this got nothing to do with him I'm just talking about what a man did at a certain point in time in his life so then three days later I recite a Pac line and they come after me like oh now you're reciting Pac lines right. I'm like my nigga I don't got no beef with Tupac right. I'm telling you I feel like well, he, he might have slipped up as a man when he did it and not realize what he was doing right. but I said at the same time he also could have been doing it for entertainment purposes right and this was the same That's conversation I, I had about Cameron. I said, I, I, somebody said, yo, Cam is doing a radio run this week. I want you to interview Cam. I said, well, listen, I'm going to let you know this so you can let him know now that I'm going to ask him this question. I know that men take that type of shit serious, so I'm going to let you know now I'm going to ask him this. Right. So 
And I broke it down to him, and he was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. He never got back to me about the interview, because I guess he probably said something. And boy was like, oh, we ain't doing that. You well, know when, what I mean? when Cameron goes for an interview, he normally doesn't have people being like, yo, this is the wild ass shit I'm going to say to him, because normally people are thirsty as fuck for the interview, right? Yeah. And you apparently weren't that thirsty? No, I'm not thirsty to speak to no man. Like, yeah. You know what I mean? Like, you either fuck with me or you don't. Like, right. I'm not that type of person. Like, I like I. I like a lot of people that I talk shit about. The thing mm. is, is that I talk shit about everybody. Like, my friends, like, I'll joke on you, and it, it's just talking shit. Some motherfuckers take it as they're going to shoot you or some shit. They be right. like, I'm going to kill you. for You be like, nigga, relax. Like, but, but you know how the game works now, especially that you say some shit on Twitter, and it gets the context gets completely removed. Yeah, the five really, tweets before that, the five tweets after exactly. that. Exactly. But so are you, like, more and more taking that into account, or are you, like, just nah, I don't dedicated care. to being yourself? No, nah, I don't care. I'm, I got to be myself because then I won't really be able to sleep at night right. if I'm sitting here having to wake up and act like somebody every day. That's a hard job. Yeah. I'm not really into that. And it's a whole bunch of other people that are suffering from identity crisis out there that, do, that does that. And that's why they be stressed out. I'm not stressed out. I'm chilling. Like, But so when you go out in New York, though, is it like, are, are, are you concerned with how you move and stuff because of the fact that you know that you've offended a lot of people? Or are you just kind of like, fuck it, I'm out here. You know, I don't, I don't nah, care. We, you know, we, I move according. You know what I mean? Like, I move according. I don't really come out like that and shit like that because I, I don't really go places that I don't got no business being. Right. So I'd be like, if I don't got no money there, I, don't, I shouldn't be. There. Like right. it's hardly I do social events unless it's something beneficial right. to my brand or what I'm trying to do. I don't really care about none of that shit. So like, you don't really feel comfortable doing like the industry fucking listening party bullshit. I've I've do them for certain people if I really deal with them, but I'm just not that person. Like oh such and such is listening event. We right. have to go. It's like nigga, we going over <laughs> here. Like we going to the bar down the street from this shit. <laughs> That's what you do. You just you're a bar guy. Yeah, I go anywhere. I like to drink. You know what I mean. Okay. I, I I sit back, sip. You know, smoke some weed, yeah. shit like that. Like I don't really care for all that. And then the industry shit is like really fake. Yeah. And it, it's the you know it's the world. The world world is fake. Uh -huh. So when you when you get into another realm in the world like the music industry and then it's more fake uh, than that, it's like I'd rather just be here in the world with the regular people, right. with the regular fake people. And that's what's funny because the reason why it was a lot of rapper dudes and shit is like they don't want to go to the bar because they ain't famous at the bar. But mm -hmm. if they go to a listening party or whatever, they're famous there. People are going to no, know them and shit. people only want to go where everybody knows their name. Exactly. It's crazy, you know? right? Like, like the Chance theme song. Yeah. Where everybody knows your name. I got some rapper homies that would never go to the bar with me and my friends because they're just a regular dude there or they don't like being on Tinder because they're a regular guy on Tinder. They're not a regular guy on Instagram, you know? Yeah. Isn't that funny? Yeah, it's, it's all about, you know, people, and especially with rappers and, well, I guess celebrities or people who want to be that, they have to keep up this certain shit. So mm -hmm. when they walk in the spot and the bouncer doesn't know them or exactly, yeah. other people, you gotta wait in line. they actually feel awkward because mm -hmm. they used to being away from everybody and being fishbowled and, you know. And they build up their whole fucking identity on this idea that, like, oh, I'm trying to be special. I want special treatment. They're, yeah. they're like addicted to the attention, a lot yeah. of people. I mean, we all are to a certain extent. You got people out here that's paying, paying fucking um, fake bodyguards and entourages just to look like yeah. they're, they're somebody and they're nobody. You know what I mean? Right. And, uh, that's cool, I guess. And it know? must be weird for you, though, because you're presenting yourself in a completely different way where you're almost are sort of like actively like, I don't want to do with all this fuck shit. Yeah, that's the acting part that I'm not into. Yeah. Like, I'm not gonna be out here acting if I'm not getting paid to do so. Exactly. You know what I mean? But so, at, from a business standpoint, I noticed you've always been going hard with, like, the ads on the podcast, and you dived right into doing the live events, like, pretty early on in your career and everything. Mm -hmm. So, you you always have been, like, after, like, the money aspect of the podcast, for sure. Like, you wanted to monetize that shit. Yeah, I wanted to monetize. I was broke. I was broke. You know what I mean? Like, my the year the, the year before I really started doing the podcast, um, this is, this is, I'm going to go into the story because you interviewed um, Yes Jules mm. and um, she had words um, about me or whatever. And Yeah, you guys are going to shoot the fair one one day. Nah, I'm not fighting that girl. <laughs> I don't even, it was never even that serious to me. It was never no beef. But you know the internet, they're going to amplify shit. They like Yes Jules and tax beef. I'm not, I don't got no beef with that girl. Why would I have beef with her? Her ass is fat. But, um, so, um, what happened? What happened was basically I told her on Twitter. I said, "Put your titties and your ass away for a year." You just said that for no and reason. See if what? you could feed yourself. Mm -hmm. No, this was basically my response to her. Right. What she said on your podcast, because I was like, she was basically saying, "What is Tax Stone done for the culture or done for this?" And I'm like, I'm like, 
Bitch, I, I popped off damn near every nigga on the East Coast mm -hmm. in the last two years. You know what I mean? Besides helping other dudes do things and format, get shows together. See, the thing is this. I don't put my stamp on everything. I don't sit there and be like, I did this and I did that, even though I did a whole bunch of shit. You right. know what I mean? So when she said it, I was kind of offended. But I was like, all right, whatever. But I had to explain to her, the reason anybody is speaking to you today is because of your ass and your titties. But she's accomplished a lot outside of... Her looks, don't you think? Yeah, but she accomplished them because of her looks. Well, that might have helped to get her foot in the door, right? That's what I was trying to explain. That's why I said put your titties and your ass away for a year, and you tell me what you accomplished. Because a year before I started doing my podcast, I understood that I wanted people to really be in love with my mind. Mm -hmm. So I stripped myself of everything. I didn't care about the jewelry. I didn't care about the new clothes, nothing. I was hardly getting haircuts. Mm -hmm. So when I was doing my thing and my podcast is taking off, I'm understanding that it's purely off of my brain. Right. It ain't because a girl liked my six pack. It ain't because they liked my outfit, because I've been wearing the same outfit for three weeks. You understand what I'm yeah. So that was a part of my game to realize, like, and to gauge my audience, like, my audience is fucking with me because purely off of my thoughts, right. not because of nothing else. And that was a part of my game, and that's what I did. So that's why I said that to her, like, yo, put your titties and ass away for a year. But do you, so you feel some type of way about her accomplishing so much based on the fact that she's white and she's hot and she's clearly using those, like, things to No, 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 no. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not saying that without, the reason I said it was, don't come at me and try to shun my accomplishments on whatever I've done right. when you clearly only accomplished what you're doing because you be having your ass out. Now, the thing is this. I've, I've been watching her lately because I went and followed her after all this shit. I was like, let me follow her and monitor her whatever. And I see what she's doing. She hosting parties and shit like that. Mm -hmm. And and it's cool. Whatever she do is cool. I don't got no beef with the girl. Just like I, I said before, I didn't. I just was telling her to be quiet with the comment she said about black women. I'm like, that's a dangerous land you don't want to tread into. Mm -hmm. I'm actually giving you some advice. Shut the fuck up. <laughs> because I ain't going to be able to save you when one of these angry black bitches whip on your ass. Right. I'm giving you some words of wisdom just just take it in stride it ain't no beef you know what i mean right i listen i'm a black man and i can't say much about a black woman right so if you think you could you in a dangerous world and that's all i was really trying to say to the chick you know what i mean i'm not mad at nothing What's she, she doing um, there was some shit from back in the day where she said something about man, I can't remember she comes so, in the room. it yeah. wasn't that bad she said she come in the room with um what up she always wonder why black girls be so mad at her because she comes in the room and she leaves with the light-skinned guy or some shit like that. And then it was like another tweet after that. And I was like, listen, stop the black women shit. Why they met? Leave that alone. That's right. a dangerous land. Like you was better off talking about black men, not right. black women. <laughs> you put yourself in a weird position being a white person in hip hop, don't you think? Because it's like you kind of yeah. are not allowed to comment on a lot of the things that are going on. Yeah, I on. guess because you know certain you know racial aspects and things. Like me personally, like I grew up with a lot of white dudes, so like my, I got white friends that say nigga. I'm not offended. No that doesn't shit, bother form you. Of fashion. Nah, I'm, I'm a podcast host. I can't go near that word. Nah, don't <laughs> don't. I wouldn't advise it if you're yeah. trying to still eat out here. Nah, you know what I mean. I was never that dude because I remember when I first moved in New York when I was like 18, 19 and I realized that every white kid in Brooklyn said it mm -hmm. and I might have like, you know, tried it on once or twice but I was like no, nah, that ain't, that, I can't, I nah, don't sound right yeah, with that. you gotta yeah. tread lightly with that. Yeah. I feel and then there's people that. like, I'm not offended by it but it's, it's people that's truly offended by it so it's like I, t I always give that word of like, man, don't say that shit, man, cause. You can't say it to somebody, like I look at shit like that if you a parent or if you have grandparents or like you talking about your people depending on where your people from mm -hmm. And you, cause if you travel overseas, you know, travel overseas. So my brother just came back. Shout out to the bartenders. They just came back from overseas. And if you shout come, out to the Bronx, you know what yeah. I'm saying. If you come in Harlem and of course uh, Brooklyn, shout out to Brownsville. If you um, if you go overseas, you might see a white person off top, and they'd be like, "What's up, my nigga?" Everywhere. Because that's overseas, the perception man. that we yeah. send. Mm -hmm. So and then if you like, you, you, wherever your nationality. So if you African, you go overseas. You Guyanese, you Serbian, whatever you are, your particular 
because everywhere in Europe was colonialized. They colonialized some motherfucking place with people of color. Mm-hmm. So there's a co- there's a community that they colonized that goes back to the fucking European motherland. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? So when you over there, all the kids right now in Paris, all the kids in, in London, they all want to be. They all on some trap nigga shit. So then all the um, all the Indian people, the South Asian people, and then all the native Europeans, they on the same shit. Mm-hmm. So for hip hop, it's desensitized the word for my grandfather for my father you you would they would exactly. kill you yeah, yeah. they're not trying to help saying they would kill you mm-hmm. they they're literally if an old person would try to kill you and then that's out of respect mm-hmm. you know what i'm saying you would have to and that's the only thing i say i understand what it is There's no you know it, it doesn't because i know i know the the um and that's a deeper conversation but i know the mindset like i fuck with adam and adam do all type of wild shit but he does it it's a pure heart it's like when you come if you look at comedy it's for comedy if you look at commentary it's for commentary but a lot of people truly do shit out of ignorance you see what i'm saying mm-hmm. so if you get that that racial overtone and i don't i thought she was i didn't even know that what y'all said about jewel shout out to jewel she doing her thing if we live in a, a sexist and racist world so if you're a woman if you're a white woman whoever type of woman you got a fat ass and big titties that's what's going to drive that you would be ridiculous to do that you would be ridiculous not to play on that sexist nah, yeah, part you would be wrong. ridiculous i always you know tell I mean? women listen use your sexuality and yeah. and and use it properly because yes men are going to deal with you because of the way you look or you know um the way you present yourself but the way you present yourself is is going to be the same reason why you know the respect level that you're going to get right so just like I said, that's that's the reason why I told her that because I was like, um, you use only your brain, mm-hmm. use only your brain, use that as your only tool, and then we could speak about comparisons with each other. I don't know about you know that. I respect the because fact that she uses both. Dick. I got a big yeah. dick. Well, there you go. I can start putting my dick on Instagram. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I do a couple more sit-ups. I can start putting my dick on Instagram and shit. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. And I I probably be lit. Right. I probably get a couple. You know, thirty more thousand followers or something. All the fat bitches gonna follow me. The thing with her though is that like all she got to do is have a bathing suit on for everybody to notice that she got a huge ass. Mm -hmm. So it's like she kind of every photo she posts sort of looks like she's thirst trapping a little bit because of the fact that she just is hot. You know, Mm -hmm. so it's like I don't know. I I I've saw the the tweet that she said back then, and I forget. I wish I could quote it right now because it was kind of like some. It didn't really like seem that bad to me. You know, I I felt bad. Nah, it wasn't that bad. Yeah, it wasn't. But it is like you got to be real careful. But it's like you. You gotta be careful because you a white woman in hip hop. Mm-hmm. You're gonna get fucked up. Cause guess <laughs> what? It's a black woman out there that probably was trying to do the same thing that you're doing, right. and you doing it better than her right now, or get more recognition. Right. Somebody's mad. You gotta relax. Right. Like, you know what I mean? Like seriously. So that's all it was. It was just a warning on like you just know your position because that one little racial slur in your career. You yeah. Know what I mean? We've seen it happen before. Yeah. How you feel about that, Andrew Schultz dude? Uh, Calling out, saying that there's like a culture of violence and hip hop and stuff. He caught a lot of a lot of shit after the whole incident that happened the other day. Well, I think I think I think um, Andrew Schultz. Andrew Schultz is he love hip hop. That right. motherfucker be putting me on the shit. But is like, that an example of a white dude like going over the line and saying that? No, like, I don't really think. You know, I think that's his opinion. Mm-hmm. I think that's his opinion. Like everybody has an uh, has an opinion. You know what I mean? And like it's not wrong or right. That's his opinion. Like, that's what he sees, and that's it. But if he said that and he was black, it probably wouldn't have been in any website, right? Maybe not. Yeah. Maybe not. People probably would have just been like, oh, this black guy doesn't know what he's talking about, you know what I mean, or whatever like that. But because he's white and people feel like he's capitalizing off the culture, right? you know what I mean, they're going to be like, oh, how dare you, and you, you know? Yeah. So I understand it on both ends. Can we, uh, can we, well, have you ran into uh, Twitter beef with, like, the feminist community at all? Yeah. For, like, what kind of statements and shit? I forgot. Because <laughs> what happens with me is that, you know, I say certain things and then I offend a group of people. And it really be, I didn't really want to offend that group of people. Right. And then when I do it, they come at me. So now I just start insulting them to the kick to the T. Like, you know what, fuck everybody. Mm-hmm. And just keep, you know, bothering them. So that's the weird thing is that, like, for you, it is a good thing to court some controversy because then people start talking about you, give something. Yo, but I don't do none of this shit you don't on feel purpose. It, you don't plan it. Okay. None of this shit is on purpose. Like, I've never said, like, let me say this because it's going to cause this effect you know what i mean right like my brain just 
runs and it works how it works. So as as it goes, I think and I say whatever I say. Mm-hmm. Like it's not no pre planned shit. Nothing is premeditated. Yeah. It's just it's just a just a natural thought. Can we uh rehash this whole scenario with Ebro? Because uh for those who don't know, you were wilding out on the podcast the other day explaining this whole situation and it was incredibly entertaining and I just mm-hmm. I feel like our audience kinda needs to know. Um well e- Ebro, I don't you know, I don't have any issues I didn't have any issues with Ebro. Um, it was like a friendly competition. I'm not even going to say competition, but basically what happened with Ebro was that I was on Twitter and I was promoting a lot of the New York rappers that was coming out. Mm-hmm. The thing was, Hot 97 was, you know, playing the most terrible music that they possibly can. Yeah. And um, It's the, been that the, way for a long the time. The kids <laughs> that I was promoting are the kids that... New York City wanted to hear. Yeah. These are the kids that the, the mass population fucked with. So when I was like, you know, first promoting Bobby Schmurder and GS9, and I'm telling him like, yo, these are the records you need to play. And he's like, says who? And I'm like, the whole city. Like, mm-hmm. and then he's seeing how many people retweeting it from the city. Like, yo, we fuck with this. And then what happened was that he, he realized that he had to start paying attention to me. Right. So he followed me. And then, you know, the whole Hot 97 staff was just following me. And, uh, but, you know, I would talk shit about them because it's bad. The station is bad. Like, it's bad. It's very bad. Mm-hmm. So, you know, we would just, like, come at each other and say little jokes. But I think people, like, Spectators thought we really had beef. Right. I never really had no beef with that dude. Like I'm not, you know what I mean? It was nothing like that. It would that. take a lot more for you to have beef yeah. with somebody, right? I seen him in Henny Palooza and you know, it was all kumbaya. And he was nervous. I seen he was nervous, you know what I mean, when I first seen him and shit like that. But I didn't understand. I'm like, my nigga, I ain't got no issues with you. So that was really it. And then what happened was when the Drake um, back to back came out, and when all these them records came out, when Meek Mill was saying Drake um, had writers, yep. I told everybody the Funk Flex didn't have the record, mm-hmm. and this was at like three o'clock in the afternoon, and Flex don't come on till six or seven. Right. So people was like tweeting Hot ninety seven, like text on and saying y'all don't got the record. Is it true? And this is and hours because beforehand. this was the day that they were supposed to have the yeah. Meek Mill disc, and then they didn't put it out, and everybody's like, "What the fuck?" Exactly. Yeah. So I was telling them they didn't have the record or whatever, and this, that, and the third. So then later that day, no record drop. Yeah. He was so pissed, he didn't even know what to do. I wake up in the morning to tweet. He just tweeting dumb shit. Like I've seen Tax six times. He's never put his hands on me. That kid doesn't want it with me. Meanwhile, I'm sitting there like. I didn't know we had a problem. Yeah. Like, are you insinuating that we had a problem and I seen you six times and I did nothing? Right. So I didn't understand how to respond to that because I was confused. Like, yo, I have seen this dude this amount of times he's saying it has never been an issue because it was never an issue. Right. So I didn't understand what he was doing. So I started thinking he was baiting me to jump out the window. Right. I was thinking, like, maybe this dude is baiting me to jump out the window so I could lose my money and shit like that. And he could paint this picture of me that he's been trying to paint to people because he's been telling people, oh, you shouldn't work with him and this, that, and the third. So I was like, this is what he was what calling he's to do. people that you work for and shit, trying to get fired, yeah, too. Yeah, emailed them, called people. Intense. Yeah, yeah. He's a different type of um, dude. You know what I mean? Um, you know, it's not the much you could you could um, expect from antelope. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. So it's like you know I don't I don't blame him. You know what I mean I expect that type of behavior from him. I should have expected that type of behavior. You right. Know? So yeah, he, he he sent emails and all his weird shit. So that's when I said the shit about his wife. And just like I said, I wasn't really trying to use her. Well, I was using her, but I wasn't trying to disrespect her. You know. But what this mean? is your strategy. Yeah. Because you're going to disrespect, you're going to do something so bad that they have to do something to you or else they're going to look pussy. This is how you explained it. And I thought that was pretty pretty interesting. Yeah, because what I realized is that I felt like he was trying to put me in a position to do something to him. Right. You know what I mean? So I'm like, listen, I'm not doing nothing to you. I'm not here for that. And that's another reason why I don't care about the word nigga. Because it's just certain things that's not going to trigger me to send me to jail. You understand what I'm right. saying? You call me nigga five times. I'm going to just walk away like, all right, man, be safe. Because I know if you saying that word, you want the drama. Right, you right. you have to want it. 
So, but what's the difference between somebody just calling you pussy mad times? Like they're, they're kind of baiting you into the same shit, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's true. That's like the same thing. You know, yeah. any type of insult where you continuously, you know, you baiting somebody to try to respond or whatever. And that's and that's what I felt like he was doing to me. So I said some disrespectful shit about his wife. I, what it was that I didn't disrespect his wife at first. I called I called him a pathological liar, uh-huh. and he didn't know why I was saying it, but I kept calling him a liar. Why and were you he, saying? He that? finally had to respond, and he was like, "Lying about what?" And I was like, yeah, lying about your wife graduating from Harvard. She never graduated. How'd you know that? Somebody filled you in? Well, you know, you be around. You know? <laughs> I happen to know people that was in Harvard with her. Okay. So, you know what I mean? So that, that happened real fast. She was in Harvard for a year and got kicked out. And wow. then he, that's his story. Anytime people up there, he bring his girl up. People are like, yeah, because you know my girl graduated from Harvard. So when I said it, it like body bagged him because he don't even know people knew who his girl was. Ooh, okay. So I guess that fucked with him. And then he was like, how does this guy? I know this and know all this shit, you know what I mean? It's fucking with his head or whatever. And then, you know, he trying to figure it out. And then I just was like, yo, man, if I'm lying, just put the degree up. Yeah. Never going to present a degree because it wasn't, you know, right. it was what it was. Uh-huh. So, you know, I guess that hit him hard. And then like he said some other disrespectful shit to me. And then I disrespected Rosenberg and his wife or whatever. Why, why do you uh, disrespect Rosenberg? What happened with that? Because he, he was, was a part of in? it. Okay, yeah, yeah, he was um, he was like sending his little like subliminal shots and shit to me. Like, oh, who those podcasters right. and stuff like that. And I, I said, just like I said, I didn't even know what none of that shit meant. Like, like even now when people be like, oh, they're a podcast. Podcaster. I'm like, what does that oh, mean? Insult, like, yes, yeah. I am a podcaster. But like, how do motherfuckers with jobs get off saying that about somebody who's doing this shit independently? Like that they yeah. own. However, I mean, I don't know if you own your entire thing because you have your sound with a network or whatever. But mm-hmm. I mean, like, you're way more independent. You have way more creative integrity or potential integrity with your content than anybody who works at a radio station. Whereas Ebro, no shots of Ebro. I don't want beef with any of these old heads, but. He can't even, like, when he sits there and defends the shit that they play on Hot 97, Mm -hmm. he can't give a good reason for why they won't play shit by emerging artists besides capitalism. Like, Mm -hmm. you know, the the label or the the radio station needs to make as much money as possible. And it's like, we get that. But at the same time, like, you do have some kind of, like, cultural, uh, you know, you, you... are expected to do things for the exactly. culture because you are the fucking main it's a source code of, of that ethics. shit. Yeah, like, it's help a code of ethics with it. Like slip in a song, slip in the first minute of a song in some sets or some shit. You know, and, they, and that's why these artists had to go out of town and break. This is why artists like French Montana got to go other places. Nicki Minaj got to go down to Atlanta. Right. Why the fuck was New York not supporting Nicki Minaj? Nicki Minaj been was rapping. Right. You know, she been was good. She was doing her little thing. Why does she have to go down south to break? Because Ebro Darden, that's from Sacramento. Sacramento was um was motherfucking the program director at Hot 97. And the thing was with me, because I'm like shit, it wasn't even like you was playing niggas music from Sacramento. <laughs> Yeah. Like, I could have understood that. Like, he's from Sacramento, so he playing niggas music from Sacramento. But they're not playing anything regional. They're just playing the shit that they Whatever have to Whatever they yeah. think, yeah. And it's like, and that's where you become, um, you become distant from the culture. And exactly, that's when the culture yeah. goes against you. And that's what happened in New York City. Like, we was raised on Hot 97, so for, for your, your, us to shit on Hot 97, like, it's just funny hearing people, like, talk about Summer Jam. Like, nigga, I ain't going to no Summer Jam. Like, that was, like, a must. Yeah. Summer Jam is a staple. Like, like you early know what I mean? 2000s and shit, it was still kind of like that, yeah, but it ain't really like that at nobody all. Nobody cares. Yeah. Like, nobody cares anymore. It's like, it became disgusting. And I think he was part of the destruction of that whole building. I don't think he could do anything to play the shit that, you know, is from younger artists or anything if he wanted to, but he doesn't want to go on the radio and admit that, like, yo, I'm powerless because I work for a giant corporation and I can't. Yeah. Facts. That's what I was going to add because I've been in the game, man, for a minute, right? And when you say that about Ebro, you have to go in and really know how he got into power. And he was at Camiel and, and really how um, the, they have formulated playlists. Mm-hmm. That's some sci- it's almost like some science shit. Yeah. And even if you go beyond, um, they, they had Arbitron at one time. Now they got the new shit with the couple of seconds. Mm-hmm. And it's all formulated. So at the end of the day... He like the uh, general manager at a bank. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you don't have no bread. You no, his, general manager at the bank. I think he's his job is to answer to the people when it comes to that shit. Your program, and he's not even anymore. He's, I don't even. Yeah, he's no, he's not, not even anymore. anymore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he got got demoted. But yeah. in, in that position, you, know, you you got to stand up for the giant corporation that you work for. That's that's your job is to take the shit for, for the company. You know exactly. Yeah. yeah. But yep. he's slick though. One thing, and you you'll say this too, because anybody that disagree with Tax Stone, you definitely got to understand. 
I like tax. I like any anybody that come from the environment that we come from that spar with somebody mentally because we can we can all bust our gun right now we can all whatever that's the most savage shit that's the most that's easy what a baby do when you slap babies cry they scream that's you have to learn to stop crying you have to learn to stop smacking motherfuckers in the head that's what a baby will do if you have your baby just slap you in the face mm -hmm. but you're trained socially to not slap somebody in the face yeah and only the true among us can have that balance of that so ebro he spars with most people from your from the, your generation and down. They don't even know how to talk to him. Yeah. And then because you're not a rapper, see that uh, that's another stall out move you did. Because most people are rappers, mm -hmm. and he stalls them out like, "Oh, you're an angry rapper. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You're broke. You're this and that." Mm -hmm. And his whole standpoint is that you have something you're not trying to be in his lane, yeah. and then you're sharp. So that killed him. He never had an adversary like that. And he really, I be seeing his face when he say your name and shit. He really got respect for you. He ain't going to let the people know. Mm -hmm. And that's just how they play the game. That's how this shit go. You know, I, I had um, I had respect for the dude, too, because, you know, um, like, he was like, he, he reached out to me, right, and was like, yo, I could help you with this podcast shit you're trying to do and this, that, and the third. And I respected it at the time because I was like, I was like, damn, that's, that's all right, man, because I know he see that I fuck with Charlemagne. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Now, I never told Charlemagne what Ebro was talking about doing or anything like that. Um, Charlemagne just was like, yo, we going to get you a fucking podcast. You know what I mean? And then he went through and did it mm -hmm. and then went through and did everything else. So I think when I, when I went through and did the podcast with Charlemagne, that's when he started drawing away. And, like, I just inherited his issues that he had it's with Charlemagne. It's serious with them, huh? Yeah, they okay. dislike each other, right. you know, and I don't mind because I don't care. But at the same time, a grown man, like I never went to Charlemagne like, yo, um, I'm not fucking with Ebro because you got beef with him. I still was talking to the dude and all that. Like, I don't know what they beef stand on. Like, if it's beef like where it's like where you're going to get home or something, then it's different. But it's like if it's not, then it's not. So I think that was a part of what happened. And he was like, oh, you fucking with Charlemagne, so we ain't fucking with you type shit. And it's mm -hmm. like, I'm not doing that with nobody, my nigga. I was in a gang as a child. I'm not with that no more. More. I'm not trying to be in cliques where I got to, where, where, right. where if you get in trouble, I get in trouble. We all got to get in trouble. I'm not here for that because when I got in trouble for other people, I couldn't call them for a dollar in jail. Mm -hmm. So it's like, you know what I mean? It's, it, I, don't, I'm not, I'm not, I don't care for those type of cliques and connections with people. Like, we could be loyal to each other like as men because I fuck with you. I won't let nothing happen to you or vice versa. You know what I mean? But I don't want that that collective where I'm down with a group of people that I don't even know, you know what I mean, anymore. I don't like that type of shit because it puts you in a lot of danger. It puts you in a lot of trouble, and I'm, I'm not with inheriting people problems. You think that, like, uh, the establishment New York hip-hop industry is, like, threatened by somebody like you coming out and making a name for yourself outside of the confines of their fucking business model? Yeah, because... Um, what happens, what, well, what's happening right now is that you got people that love me. And mm. it was shocking to me because I thought I talked too much shit and people ain't like it. But what I've realized is a lot of things that I say, people think the same thing. They just don't say it. Yeah. So now, now with that type of, that type of energy, it's, it's loved and it's hated at the same time because you have the people that never spoke their mind right that's always conforming and scripting everything that they say and then you got a guy like me that's coming unscripted raw just saying whatever and it's flourishing so now it's fucking up their situation it's almost like when 50 cent dropped when 50 cent dropped every rapper became a gangster rapper right for like two years yeah well, I was, everybody i, I always want to know that were you a student of 50 like you really paid attention to his moves and everything early I, on? I, I like 50 cent like I, I always watch um how 50 cent moves that's i'm saying i felt like i really like learned a lot about like how to carry myself in like business situations and shit both by the shit he did right and the shit he fucked up early mm -hmm. on you know yeah everybody's story is a lesson yeah you know what i mean so i like to i always watch the people before me and i'd be like let me watch these motherfuckers and see how he won and see how he lost and that was like part of the discussion that I was giving um, a kid about Big Meech that I was telling about y'all earlier. Yeah, we should probably touch on that. Um, basically, I tweeted, I tweeted out, I said you were, you would rather be the um, guy working in Burger King than Big Meech right now. And somebody took it as like I was trying to diss Big Meech, and it was like, nah, my nigga, what I'm saying is that regardless of what you do, you know what I mean? If you're doing crime, you gotta know the ending. 
It's really two endings. It's not a lie. I know you heard this in school, whatever. You're going to die or you're going to go to jail. It's two endings. It's, it's not many men that, that make it through and have five grandkids and die by natural causes. It's not many of us. Mm -hmm. I know I know some. Don't get it twisted. I do know some dudes, and I, I love them to death just off seeing them, like, that they made it this far. But it's not. It's a rarity, you understand? And people need to understand that. So when I said that, I just basically was saying, like, my nigga, you would rather just go get a job than to say, I had a 10-year run getting money, and now I got to do 50 years. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. Fuck that 10-year run. You'd rather have a 30-year run or just fucking some regular bitches. You know what I mean? <laughs> Wearing some regular jeans. You know what I mean? Some regular jeans. I love, you always say the shit about the jeans. Like, y'all motherfuckers going to be in jail for 20 years, and all you got is some jeans. All you got is some jeans. Because, <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I when I was a kid, like, I got lawsuits when I turned 18, a whole bunch of money. I had, like, five, six lawsuits I got back to back, and... I spent my money on a Vizu jeans, like a Vizu jeans and um, high top Pradas. Like, and now it's Balmain and True Exactly. And shit, the and shit played the out mistake, two years right? later. Yeah. So when you look at this shit and you say, yo, my nigga, I spent, this is what I spent my money on my fortune and I'm outside doing crime and then I'm getting arrested and then I got to call four or five people to get the bail money together. Yeah. When the bail money is right there, all them jeans. <laughs> yo, you know, it's crazy because what's, what's the boys that got, that got cracked in um, Brooklyn? The um, GS9? Nah, the, the 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 young boys they was doing the panda shit. They just got busted and they and they used their lyrics oh, against yeah, the scammers. The yeah, pop out boys. Yeah, the pop out boys. So look, so they had a picture of them in ball mains, right? And the and the, and, the, and the ones used that against them, right? So when the Johnnies ran that shit on them, what what I thought was funny, cause I know people that shot people in '87 for they starter jackets mm. and went to jail for murder. Yep. For a starter jacket. So just imagine, you they're 17 years home. old. And they're getting home now. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's crazy, man. And you shot somebody for a jacket that, don't, that motherfuckers don't even rock. Mm -hmm. Or motherfuckers that shot people for the, uh, first, and... the first Air Jordans. Right. Mm -hmm. Air Jordan 2. My grandma lived in Chicago. I saw the first time I saw somebody get murdered at gunpoint was at Caprini Green. Bam. Over a pair of J's. R.I.P. Caprini Green shot. You feel me? That's just yeah. gone now, right? That shit gone like yeah. a motherfucker. But my point is to just know to to just know how motherfuckers don't think that. They don't think about the cycle of the shit that you're going through right now is so small. There's, there's like whatever you got physically you got on your body. Like you go to jail with that. You know, you go to jail with whatever you got in your pocket. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Whatever you wearing. So when you get out, that's the shit you got unless you got some other shit. Mm -hmm. That's what you got. So it's motherfuckers that went to jail and have no commissary, no they don't have no family, nothing. When they get out of jail, they got the old shit they had. Yeah, and those and jeans I, are worthless. I seen a motherfucker later, leave right? jail one day, and he tried to leave with his TV. And you know, like <laughs> when niggas leave, everybody leave their TV to somebody else. This motherfucker was leaving with his TV, and I had to really ask him, "Yo, what the fuck are you doing? What are you doing?" And he was like, "What you talking about?" I said, "You going home with the TV?" He was like, "I ain't got no TV at home." I said, "What the fuck?" And it fucked me up, but I had to realize this motherfucker just did 18 years. Yeah. He probably don't got shit. a TV yeah. at home. Like, just like he said, he might not have home. A home. Yeah. Yo, let me, let me ask you this. I heard you say that in the hood or where you grew up, that the, only, the biggest things you could do to make a name for yourself is either to kill somebody or to go to jail. We're all in our 30s. We all see how fucking stupid and terrible that mentality is. How do you, mm -hmm. how do you tell an 18-year-old kid that who's wrapped up in this shit and doesn't see the fucking forest from the trees? Well, you know, I, I've, been in, I've been outside for, for years, and, like, kids know that that's from my neighborhood and other places. So when I do tell them that type of shit, they take heed. Right. Like, I got messages right now. Like, I don't really post them type of messages up because I don't be wanting people. I don't know if people want their business out there, but I had dudes that I had a dude just hit me on Facebook three days ago. And said, yo, my nigga, like, I love you. Like, if it wasn't for you, I'd be in jail right now. Now, I didn't know what he was talking about, but he hit me back again and said, yo, I hit you on Snapchat like two months ago and I told you about a situation. And I remember this shit. He hit me up and was like, yo, my man owe me $250. And you know what the fuck this nigga said? It was so crazy. He said, my man owe me $250. I don't know what I should do. He said, but I know Snoop said in a record. This is what he said. Like, he said that Snoop says some shit in a record, basically, like, if a nigga owe you money, go kill him. <laughs> and this is, was his reason. Like, I know Snoop said in the record that, and this is what he said to me. And I had to tell that nigga, my nigga, Snoop is, um, 
is is coaching little league football. Yeah, right. You understand? He said that shit twenty years ago or whatever. Yeah, he yeah. said that twenty years ago. When he was a kid and he was going through whatever he was going through. That nigga got kids. He got a family, and you want one too. So no, don't kill that nigga over no two hundred and fifty dollars, my nigga. Yeah, for real. I'm like two hundred and fifty dollars. Then you do twenty five years, and then what? Yeah. You know what I mean? And it's fucked up because see, I had that same mindset. Back in the day as a kid That I would have thought the same thing Those was the rules that was instilled in me yeah. So that's why I come with so many rappers that, that put out this type of image And they have kids that follow in their footsteps And the thing is That's not really their footsteps at all right. These guys are good guys they, 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 they're, they're doing mad positive shit But they don't even want to rap about the positive they shit Like it's not it won't cool pop. Right, yeah. No the thing is is this man When you real with yourself You can sell anything right. You understand The thing is, is that what happens is that people think that that's the image that sells. They like, no, I gotta drink lean. I gotta go color my hair this time. Or I gotta wear tight jeans now because that's what's in. Or the phase when everybody was like a gang member in hip hop. Like it was a phase where everybody, everybody. was gang linked. <laughs> right. Niggas thought Nori was blood. Everybody <laughs> in the world. Like, and it was a phase where everybody was wearing bandanas. The thing is to not get caught up in these phases, right. you know, and these these fads that come and go because it's all smoke screens. The shit is not real. But like Future said, like when they asked him one time about rapping about drugs, he was like, you know, I feel like drugs are what everybody talks about. That's the thing that they like to hear about the most. Because obviously Future can rap about whatever the fuck he wants. He raps about Zans because all these kids at the shows are popping Zans and doing blow and all this shit. And the whole he's United States of America is on opiates right now. <laughs> yeah. So he's actually doing a, you know, it's a great marketing scheme. Like yeah. if they if you look at the DEA website right now and they tell you that motherfucking um, 65% of America is on opiates, right. you need to rap about some opiates. But mem yeah. remember when Future fell off when he made an album where he seemed kind of happy and like he had a nice relationship yeah, yeah. and shit? He fell off by talking about some nice positive shit sort of, you know? And because the, he didn't come in on that. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, you gotta, you know, people, your call look for the, what they first bought from you. Yeah, exactly. You know what I mean? If you got a product, whatever it is, they want that first weed they bought they always looking for that first high they all right. addicts we all looking for that first high again we never get it but that's what we looking for but you, you do interview a lot of like positive people and people who are making changes activist type people and all yeah. kinds of interesting people but then obviously you're known as Tech Stone the dude who talks about beef and says wild ass shit yeah but you know the thing is, is that I think people People don't get my messages. Mm -hmm. I always tell motherfuckers, you got to feed the kids the medicine through the candy. So if I talk these kids' language, they understand me better than me walking in like a drug counselor that never did drugs mm -hmm. and telling them not to use drugs. I could tell you, nigga, I pop Zans. I pop Perks. I used to sell drugs in Allentown, Pennsylvania. Ooh, it was just a, a cool thing to do out there. It was regular. Yeah. The girls did it, everybody. Give me a perk. Word, I could fuck better on this. You know what I <laughs> mean? So I did it. So I could tell you, nigga, keep using them perks. You it, you ain't going to be able to take a shit for two weeks. Keep, you know what I mean? I could tell you these things as I really did it. Right. So when they hear it from me, it, 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 it's a message for them. So, like, you know, I have certain square, square people. Like, I got mad people that, like, listen to my podcast, like, people from all walks of life. But I have certain people that's, like, from conservative walks of life that can't listen because they can't, they can't listen to the message right. because of how it's delivered. You know what I mean? And I tell them it's not for you. Yeah. It's not for you. It's for them. I'm talking to them. And I always try to talk to the to the to the kids in the neighborhood, especially because they misguided. It's a lot of motherfuckers like it's a motherfucker out there right now that's plotting on robbing somebody for five thousand dollars, not realizing that if he gets caught, his bail is gonna be fifteen thousand. You know what I mean? Right. Like it's about basic shit that we got to teach motherfuckers so they'll stop doing dumb things. Right. You know what I mean? Like, I had to go to jail to understand, like, yo, I like I'm, I had a connect, a weed connect back in the days. Yeah, you robbed him, yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> like, and he was giving me pounds for 400. This was Ari back in the days and shit, but 400 was great. Back. 400 on the East Coast? What the fuck you no, doing? No, believe me, niggas wasn't even getting it for four at that time, so yeah. it was a great time. But I robbed the motherfucker. Yeah. And I had to understand why would I rob this dude for five pounds when... I was getting so many pounds from this nigga every other day. Why the fuck would I do that? But how, how can you explain that bad decision? Well, that bad decision came from me not me not being taught the little shit. Yeah. Me not understanding, yo, if you rob this guy for these five pounds right now, yes, it's a quick come up. But guess what? Next week, you ain't going to have nobody to buy weed from. Right. At that price. 
You understand? So I could have kept fucking with this dude, and that five pounds I robbed him for, I would have been at 15 by two weeks. I'd have kept buying from him. But I went, got the free five pounds, spent it, blew it, and was broke, and went broke because right. I had no weed connect. And I was so used to paying 400 it was hard for me to pay nine. Right. Yo. You know what I mean? Were you ever a scammer? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm from Brooklyn. We all scammers. <laughs> Every nigga from Brooklyn scams. <laughs> what kind of scams were you doing, though? Everything. Everything you could think of. Yeah. What, uh, what you want me to do? That was my shit back in the day. <laughs> Load up some credit cards to go buy some laptops and shit. Yeah? Yeah, and that's why I never really heard people ever talk. I remember thinking back in the day, like, man, if all these kids selling drugs knew about this shit, they would not be selling drugs. But I never really heard the, the term scammer that much until, like, the last year or two. Yeah, you know you know, black motherfuckers got to make shit cool. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> yeah. The motherfuckers is happy Scam- as hell of being scammer. Scamming was a nerdy ass white boy thing until fucking rappers got on I had to stop coming out saying I was a scammer because I was like I was doing scams and shit but like I, it was crazy because people that was around that was scamming more than me and just going hard, people would call them a scammer and they would be mad offended. Yeah. They'd be like, what? Don't you call me that? But meanwhile, so drug dealer is the coolest it. thing in the world to be, right? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I started saying it. Like, people, I just introduced myself as a scammer. Like, my name Tax. I'm a scammer. <laughs> because I didn't understand why people were so... I'm like, I do this. I'm not being ashamed of nothing I do. That's why I be feeling like it be people be hiding weird shit. Cause when they hide little weird shit, they be like, "Why are you hiding that?" <laughs> like I remember a girl on Twitter one day said, "All you bitch motherfuckers in group chats, that shit is for gay men and this, that, and the third. And a motherfucker that was in a group chat with us was lying, saying he wasn't in a group chat. Cause the girl said that. How could the hell could you ever explain why so, being in a group chat is gay? Yeah, That's but the this stupidest thing I've ever heard. Fuck, fuck her explanation. Why did you feel like you right. had to conform to her belief? Like, oh, I'm not no group chat. Like, I was like, nigga, what's wrong with you? So that's what I said when people be hiding little weird shit I be like something's wrong with this kid like it's bigger than this yeah. for you to be hiding that he hide more like yeah that's crazy you hide you in a group chat hey what's, what's your favorite interview you ever did uh Pee Wee Kirkland okay I think it might be one of the only ones I didn't watch yeah Pee Wee Kirkland I gotta get on that yeah Pee Wee Kirkland what's the worst one you ever did oh shit think Cardi B oh really why was that one whack cause um she didn't want to talk a lot about a lot That's of the shit. the worst, right? Yeah, she didn't want to talk a lot about a lot of shit. I think her manager was like, oh, no, nah, don't talk about that. Don't talk about that. And it was, like, awkward. So, it like, it fucked my groove up. So, I couldn't really get into the interview. Yeah. So, I, I put it out. It's, it, I was just say, like, the Cardi B episode. It's called the, it's called the Lost Episode. Oh, really? I never was going to put it out. Yeah. And then I went on vacation one week, and I just wanted to put something out. So, I put it out. How you feel about her overall, though? I'm proud of Cardi B. Like, I think Cardi B is um, phenomenal. I'm proud of what she's doing because, you know, it's people like her that's out there that, like, you know, she's talented. And what I mean by talented is she's talented at who she is. Right. Her, you know what I mean? And it's people that want to be Cardi B. There's conservative women that want to have the freedom that Cardi B has, and they don't don't have it. So they got to live vicariously through her. You know what I mean? So that's why these she got so many followers. And if you really go through it, you'll think it'd be more bird bitches and chicken heads. But it's a lot of fucking like women that like Cardi B because she's speaking truth. She's speaking women truths that other women don't feel um, okay to express. You right. know what I mean? But you and her are a lot alike. I think so. Yeah, because you both are saying some like realized shit that nobody else is saying, and you, yeah, you might not have the most class, or you might not be the most well spoken, but you're so relatable mm-hmm. that everybody hears it, and they're just like, "Yo, that's real as fuck," even if they don't actually understand where you're coming from. Exactly. Yeah, and that's. I think that's one of Cardi B gifts, and I'm I'm proud that she doing her thing out here. She ain't stripping no more, and she getting her fucking money, and she. Doing Man, I'll be thing. sitting there like refreshing the little Twitter videos of her stripping and shit, though. I'll just be watching them over and over. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. I don't know. But uh, also, I think a big thing is that she was getting a pussy eaten while drinking a Corona on the cover of her album. That was pretty cool. Oh, that's I, legendary. I had a lot of respect for that. Yeah, her, show, her fucking mixtape wasn't bad. It man. wasn't bad. Like, that was the most shit shocking was not thing ever. bad, man. Like, and people get mad at me for they like, oh, you co signed this and Slim Jesus and all this shit. What's and, up with Slim Jesus? None. I don't know. He probably dead or something. I don't know what happened <laughs> to Slim heard Jesus. about him in a minute, yeah. I like Slim Jesus. I keep telling you guys this for one sole purpose. He did an interview, and they said, we see you in an interview with all these guns. Are you a gangster? He said, no. Yeah. I'm not a gangster. Right. And I feel like that's a real nigga. Right. He's being real. Unlike people that are flaunting the guns in the videos and they say, and this is what I do. And, this, and I, just like I said, that 
some of these most of these people are encouraging behaviors that they not really into these guys live two hours away from the hood but they acting like they in the hood all the time and they and this is the kids they emulate this so now they like I'm going to go chill in front of this store. We're going to get drunk, stay here. Any ops come through, we're going to shoot. Any, and it's like, yo, that motherfucker could have said, yo, I did this, that, and the third, and I got cool with this white guy, and we created a business, and we got some fucking money. And the motherfucker might say, yo, I want to do that same thing. Right. But, but since you fucking sitting here, and this is the only way and the only pictures you keep painting, this is the only pictures motherfuckers is going to keep seeing or understanding. They're going to say, yo, I got to go get a pack. I got to go get some weed, drink me some lean you know what i mean or do some weird shit but now kids think that's how you become a man that you ain't really a man unless you got guns and lean and all this crazy shit like yeah. how, how do we like defeat that whole idea even though like I it come we- from our teachers and just like he said earlier like he said if if muhammad ali was uh, uh, uh was in this generation he would have been a rapper because he was a rebel all the rebels are basically within the music realm right now and speaking they are new activists yeah. so it's like no, you good. That's your man. He just went on the phone. That nigga's a dumb nigga, son. <laughs> like, well, it's better that he's on the phone out yeah. there than in here. Yeah. <laughs> I forgot what just the fuck I was saying. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, so this is a reader question. How to move? Ask tax how to move in a room full of vultures. I don't know, man. You just gotta, um, you always gotta, um, you just gotta maneuver. You know what I mean? You gotta maneuver correctly. Like, there's vultures in every aspect in this game. You know what I mean? Like, there's people, blood suckers, that's out to get you. You know what I mean? I, I always move like people out to get me. And you probably got ten times as many of the vultures coming for you now than you ever had before. Yeah, yeah. Cause you know, the more, the more and more bigger you get, and and especially if people start thinking you coming for their jobs, right? Like, it gets serious. Like, yeah. They'll email companies about you. They'll do weird shit. You know what I mean? Right. So I understand. I'm not mad at these motherfuckers. But is it weird for you to be in a position like when when I was just talking to you off camera about the shit back in the day, which is all squashed now with Combat Jack and Rosenberg, where Rosenberg said he would beat the shit out of him in front of his kids. Mm-hmm. Combat's like your man. Is it weird for you to go and be cool with Rosenberg or be around somebody like that when he says something like that to your man? Because if you were in the streets, you wouldn't let somebody say that to your friend and be cool with him, right? Nah, nah. And that's what I that's what I was trying to explain. Explain to people when, like, when this, when I first got into podcasting, and people were trying to act like, well, you're with this clique and you're with that clique, and I'm like, nigga, I'm not with no clique. So you got to take on a whole different attitude <laughs> towards everybody now, yeah, because yeah, you're in the industry. Yeah. yeah, I had to explain to people like, because see, the thing is this. Being in clicks don't save my job. Right. You understand me? Or don't don't feed me. It doesn't do nothing. If you tell me being in this clique will get me this certain amount of money a month, we probably could speak about this shit. Mm-hmm. But if it don't, I'm not with it. So just like I said, like I didn't um, pick up Charlemagne's issues with Hot 97. I already had issues with Hot 97. <laughs> I already was like, you motherfuckers are bozos over there. You right. know what I mean? And it's so sad over there to the point to where people that work at Hot 97 that like me can't even speak to me in public or tweet me. They got to DM me and say, yo, great job. Just listen to the podcast. Or, you know, That's weird crazy. shit. And I'd be like, damn, motherfucker can't even say it out loud because this person that they clicked up with is going to feel betrayed. Right. You understand? I I'm not doing that. Like, if Ebro had a good show or some shit, I would be like, yo, good show, Ebro. And he don't have good shows. So it's, it's, <laughs> I can't say that. You know what I mean? Yeah. Hey, is uh, were the people too hard on designer? You defend them a bunch. What, what's yeah, good? I defend designer a lot. You know what I mean? Like, I don't think they was too hard. I felt like they would do that. You know what I mean? Because when I first heard the record, I thought it was Future. Yeah. You know what I mean? When I first heard it, I was like, this shit sound like Future. Thing was that the second time I heard it, I said, this is a great song. Yeah. I don't give a fuck who made it. You know what I mean? Yeah. I kept listening to it, and I was like, it's a great song. I just started promoting that shit on the internet, and it flew. But is everybody just too quick to shit on a kid from Brooklyn? Nah, you know, that was a, that's my argument, because when I help these kids out, I always look at that point. Like, I was 17, 18 at one time. I used to rap when I was in my teens. Yeah. You know how much I would have loved for Kanye West to sign me, yeah. or one of your idols to come through? You 18 years old. So this is what I kept trying to explain to people. I'm like, this motherfucker just made a hit record at 18. Cool, he sound like Future, but he's 18. Yeah. A nigga like Future's supposed to look at that as, as flattery. Like, yo, man, that's some fly shit. Kid try to sound, you know what I mean? And not look at it so much like he's trying to take your lane or whatever the fuck it but, might be. You know what that is? I, I just want to add this, too. Y'all add this, because mm-hmm. it's just, like, rap is the only shit, too, that I know 
where grown motherfuckers argue with kids. Yeah, okay. Because they don't <laughs> you understand grown motherfuckers want to be kids. Right, like, like, <laughs> like real, real shit, right? Mm-hmm. Like, the average rapper, man, that's not, that you didn't watch come up, like, if you, meaning, like, if you, like, the average rapper is over 25 years old. I, I think we could all say that. Yeah. The average rapper is over 25 well, the, years the old. The popular ones, the real, like, mainstream ones. And if they're they, they 23, they're 26. And then the mainstream rappers, <laughs> yeah. most of them are over 30. Yeah. Because well, it, 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 it take that work to put Mickey, in, right? Yeah. Sure, fucking everybody, yeah. Now, where else outside of rap, where, you think about it on the block, where else, and, and you think about it, and whatever you do is a, th- is a 35-year-old man going to argue with a 15-year-old or a 16-year-old about something they do. Mm-hmm. Ice-T, shout out to OG Ice. Mm-hmm. Ice and Soldier Boy got into it. Yeah. That just show you the nature of the game. Mm. There's no way a man in his 50s should argue with a, a dude that was a teenager. Mm-hmm. Because we talking about the same thing. Because you can't win. You can't win. You mm-hmm. can't win. Like, in designer, he's supposed to sound like Future. That's who's on top. Mm-hmm. Who he's supposed to sound like. Mm-hmm. So if he would have sound like Drake, it, people would have had a problem. Yeah. If he would sound like YG, people would have. Whatever you, he, the, the whole generation, my all my nephews, they, they all, I tell them, all of them in New York, I tell them, they all sound like or want to be like mm-hmm. somebody down south. Mm-hmm. That's who on top. That's, That's who, who got the music. That's where the influence is coming from. Right. My whole thing with designer, just like I said, I'm a I'm a I'm a young nigga from Brooklyn, and I had a dream. And I always tell people part of the reason that I feel like I ended up in the streets was because the OGs didn't teach us the right way. And that's why I don't respect a lot of the OGs that want to be respected as OGs. I tell them, I be like, I can't call you my OG. You didn't teach me anything. Mm-hmm. All you was was a dude that was older than me. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So now I take my time to teach these young niggas and say things like I see I just seen a kid today say some dumb shit on Facebook like I'm quitting this fucking job and I know the nigga he on parole and shit and he's like I'm quitting this fucking job and some construction shit I'm quitting this fucking job I ain't with this shit fuck that yo somebody give me somebody give me poppy number so I, I like I hit him up I hit him up in the sidebar in the inbox and then I just dropped a little jewel on the, on the timeline so I could marinate on him and I was like listen man ain't nothing wrong with ain't nothing wrong with legal hustles my nigga yeah, right. it's nothing wrong with legal hustles and that's another thing that the OGs ain't teach us because they didn't have legal hustles so they couldn't teach us that that was a good way to go right you know what i mean now it's like that's why the black black communities are starting to get stronger now because you got guys that 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 been stopped using crack you know what i mean they stopped using crack since the 90s or the 80s and now they've cleaned up and now they teaching kids yo you got to do this and now the next generation is learning and now our kids are becoming smarter and stronger now because of that Makes sense. Oh, sorry. Uh, hey, I wanted to ask you about the the, the new class of, of rappers that are kind of popping off right now that a lot of people seem like they have opinions on. I know you interviewed Kodak, yeah. and you fuck with him heavy, which I completely, completely agree yeah, with. Yeah, I love Kodak, man. Are you familiar with, like, 21 Savage, Lil Yachty? I like Uzi, 21 all that? Savage. 21 Savage is crazy. crazy, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I like 21 Savage. Yo, he's dope. I, don't, I, I tried to listen to Lil Yachty. Um, P&B Rap likes Lil Yachty, and he's playing him in the truck, and he's like, you don't fuck with this nigga, this little boat? And I'm like, what is this shit? Like, I couldn't really get into it but i understand that my lo- my little brother love this shit mm-hmm. like he, he like little yachty thank yeah. you know what i mean <laughs> but so, wait so are you at the point where like I, I like yachty but like sometimes like an artist will come out that like clearly is appealing to like the 18 year olds so much and i feel like i'm a hip-hop fan to the extent where even if i don't necessarily fuck with the song i can look at it and say all right like this is dope like this is rap music oh, yeah, like, yeah, i yeah. love rap music it don't matter if it's for me no nah, yeah definitely that's how i sell shit i always tell people that as a drug dealer i never use those drugs I was selling them yeah. you know what I mean so it's the same thing with the music I might not like the music myself right. I'm a nigga that listen to Beanie Siegel album still once a day you know what once I mean once a day really yeah like <laughs> once a day Beans album pops up in my rotation I'm listening to Beans album I like lyrics I listen to Pusha T a lot you know what I mean same I listen man. to a lot of old raps like old Jay Z old Snoop albums like I listen to all the old albums like you know what I mean the old Nas albums like I listen to all the Vince 
vintage, good hip hop that I like that I grew up on, but I also know when there's an audience for something. Right. Like this song might not necessarily be for me and my shorty to listen to in the car, but it might be for this little nigga shorty and his, you know what I mean? Right. So that's basically what it is. You just gotta know it's an audience. I think that's what's wrong with a lot of the A&Rs in the game right now. They're so hooked on their selves and because some of these dudes be fake rappers, too. Right. So that'd be another problem with them signing people because they feel like they better than them. They'd be like, I'm nicer than this nigga. I would never sign this nigga. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, designer was going up the labels. Niggas was looking at designer like he was a joke. Yeah. What people not understanding is that motherfucking Panda came out in December. Right. Like, the end of December. You understand what I'm saying? I was started promoting that shit, like, January or some shit. Like, I just liked it. I was like, this shit is fire. And this little nigga from Brooklyn, fuck that. And the Yay album came out in, what, like, March or some shit? Exactly. Yeah. So, when all of that shit happened, so now everybody was looking like idiots, because they like, damn, this little nigga just was in his office dabbing. You know, <laughs> we thought it was a joke, because we talking about it sound like future. But that's the power of the internet also. See, the song was taking its own wave anyway. It just Kanye came and amplified it, you know what I mean, to a whole nother magnitude that it probably might have not touched, but, but the, it was going to go. Nobody expected that to go the way that it went, where the song that he sampled became way bigger than the fucking Kanye, or the, the, the original version became way bigger than the Kanye version. Yeah. Like, nobody in a million years could have expected that. Panda's fucking a good song. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm pretty sure Future had to say, this is a good fucking song, it's yeah. a good song. And it's like crazy, because you, anywhere you go in a bar with white people or whatever, that song comes on and people are losing their fucking minds, and then like, Half of them or most of them don't even know who the fuck a designer is. They yep. just like relate to that song on Panda, real. Panda, 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 <laughs> Panda, yeah, you say Panda, that, I'm gonna start dabbing. Yeah, have you ever yeah. dabbed? Nah, I'm not really a dab. That's I'm good, from dude. Brooklyn. We we milli rap. Yeah, <laughs> you know what I mean? on every block. On every block. Whatever you feel about like the competition in the podcast scene these days, because you got Elliot and uh, B Dot coming out and like trying to claim the throne in the podcast world and everything. Do you get into the competition between uh, everybody or what? No, nah, I'm not. I don't really do that. I'm doing better than all them niggas. <laughs> yeah. So I don't. I don't. I don't pay attention to that type of shit. Like I only stop paying attention when niggas start saying shit like that. Like, oh, I'm number one. I'd be like, what? Is he? Cause you need to know who's number one. You yeah. know what I mean? But it ain't. I don't know. It ain't them. But in rap, it's a constant conversation about who's number one in regards to the artists. So it's like kind of inevitable that that would happen. Mm -hmm. or, or even like you look at Power and Hot, like they've been the biggest beef of all time. Like mm -hmm. constantly, it's just like it's such a competitive culture. But it's interesting with the podcast shit because I never really felt like it was like that with the podcast shit until I heard them come in with that intro on the rap radar shit and be like the only voice in the in the rap world that matters or some shit. And I'm just like, oh my god. God, they're really coming for it now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, me personally, like, I'm not, my, my podcast is in a comedy section. Oh, really? So, you know, I don't, I don't, I never wanted it to be a complete hip hop podcast. I'm a hip hop fan. Yeah. But I'm a fan of a whole bunch of shit. And that's what I wanted Tax Season to be about all the shit I was a fan of. Like, I want to talk to, um, what, what's his name? Eisenhower. That's his name? From motherfucker. No, Heisenberg from fucking. From Breaking Bad? From Breaking Bad. Like, this <laughs> is fictional niggas, character. These is people that I want to talk to. Like, you know what I mean? I, I like that fucking show. Like, I, I want to interview. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? So it never was really based on hip hop. So I'm like, I'm not really, I don't really care that they say that, but. But what I was feeling like, you know, me being in the space now for like a year and some change, it was just a smooth space. It wasn't no who had the best podcast or, you know, it was and I'm not into that anyway, mm -hmm. because just like I said, like I'm from the streets. And when I start hearing competition, I start thinking about taking the competition out. You know what I mean? And yeah. I'm like, I'm not going to be sitting here trying to target these people and try to, you know, what I mean, like I think it's, it's, it's space for everybody to eat. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's what's crazy to me is that, like, clearly from our perspective, like, the reason why podcasting works is because you go, you do a podcast with somebody, they tweet it, they fucking share it on their Instagram or whatever, and that's good for you and it's good for them. And it's just mm -hmm. that, you know, you you do them a favor, they do you a favor by sharing it, your podcast gets bigger, their career gets a little help, and it's, like, the most beautiful exchange in the world. Like, that's mm -hmm. why I really get off on the podcast shit is just knowing that I could build connections with people and interview a DJ one day and then he hooks me up with his big homie who's 10 times more popular than him or whatever like especially because I was starting I mean I guess you're in the same boat starting from fucking absolutely nothing like Originally, it was like hard as fuck for me to even get a guest that I was happy with on the shit because mm -hmm. it's it's hard to get going. But that's why when people start acting all competitive, I'm like, that ain't really what it's about. It's about helping as many people as possible. And, and then, it's not even about that because the the competition part. Because what you always got to remember is that, like, say for instance, there might be somebody that hates Charlemagne the God, but they like hip hop, so they're gonna listen to 105.1. They're gonna listen to Power. Right. And 
They have to hear him because he's hired there. With podcasts, people choose to listen to you. Right. They choose to go there and say, I want to listen to this man speak. And somebody the other day told me, they was like, yo, why you don't give news, you know, current events that are going on through the week? And I said, because there's 20 other podcasts to do that. Yeah. Go get your news there. I'm, I don't want to. And I, I, was, I used to do that when I first started. I would give the news that's going on a week and break down. And I got tired of it because yeah. I'm, like, I'm not a news reporter. You I'm not going to be fit sitting into there. anything. Yeah. yeah. And I'm not doing all that. Ain't no format for tax season. We just going to go. We're going to have this conversation. We're going to have some fun. And we're just going to try to touch some good topics and try to get down to the root of who the people are. You know what I mean? Exactly. I like to interview rappers when they're not on media runs exactly, because. Yeah. They come on and they trying to tell, yeah, my album coming out and it's like, my nigga, little do you know, if you come here a month before your shit drop and we do this interview, that shit's going to help your sales because people are going to get to know you more. They're going to get to learn a little bit more about you and they'll like you. So they'll be like, yo, I'm going to buy this dude album just off me liking who he is and his personality. But when they come and they just on promo mode and run it it, it, it it doesn't work out well you just sound like a carbon copy of every other rapper or yeah. whoever's on the run but yeah you know March 18th this is coming out and, da, 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 and I gotta no show here and I gotta show here people don't sound like the last 35 people that said that on the radio this week right. so it's like I be trying to tell rappers yo you actually can help yourself if you come on it when you're not on your run you know what I mean exactly. and that's what I don't like to do so I don't be that's why I like a lot of podcasts they'll get artists and I won't get them because I don't want to interview them right. when they on their media run. I'd be like, nah, I don't want to talk to them. Like, I just did Mr. Fab. Mr. Fab was on his media run. Amazing. But I did him because I was just recently looking up on him. I liked the nigga. So I was like, I'm going to do that nigga. He's well, from and Cali. He beef. was the first dude I had from Cali on there. You got shared beef. What'd you say? You got shared beef, too. You guys are both beefing with the same dude. Who's that? The Math Hoffa. Nah, we not beefing. That, that wasn't the point of the interview? Was nah. like, oh, let's, let's nah. go in on this floor. I didn't even know that shit. Like, I dead ass, like, Sirius Jones was there, and I forgot right. Mad Fafa even um, snuffed him. Yeah, you were like, oh, I remember that video. Yeah. That was you. Like, you, yeah, you remember Yeah, because I, I, I didn't remember that shit. I, I remember once they said it, but I didn't know that they had they had issues with boy. Like, I'm not that type of person. I'm not going to click up with people because we don't like the same people. Like, that's not even how it goes for me. Like, I'm not that type of person. I stand on my own, too. If I, if I fucked with you, it's because I fucked with you because it's something else. It wasn't because we didn't like the same people mutually. Like, I'm not that type of person. Yeah. So I've had people say things like this to me when I've been around. They're like, yeah, I see you fuck with Boyd because he don't like it. And I'm like, what? <laughs> I had to stop fucking with the nigga now just because you think that. Like, <laughs> word. Amazing. Hey, how you feel about like the 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 women in New York or just in general like these days? Because you always got a lot of comments about like how women present themselves, how they they mm. hold themselves. You walk in a club in New York in this day and age, like what kind of women are you attracted to, and how you feel about the way that the, the sort of trends and like the way that girls feel like they have to act now? Oh, I'm attracted to all the women, but <laughs> um, you know I talk a lot about the bartenders and shit because the bartender landscape has changed in New York City. It was like a time where um, bartenders girls they were wear like all black you know what I mean black slacks maybe a black shirt or some right. shit like that something to that effect and now they wear leotard thongs yeah, yeah. so it's such a you know and sometimes they looking better than the strippers and what I did was because I like I got a couple home girls that did the bartend and I was like yo you know what I always had the conversation like yo man if you if you a bartender, it's probably because your man broke. Uh-huh. Because I've had some of them girls try to act like they was fucking with balling ass dudes, and I'm like, listen, you might be fucking with the balling ass dude, but the balling ass dude ain't fucking with you. <laughs> yeah. Cause ain't no man gonna have his girl walking around half naked serving his enemy's bottles. You don't respect that. You couldn't be with a girl who was like using her body to make money. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, if she was a model or certain things, but not not no bullshit ass bartender. You ain't even getting paid like that. You understand what I'm saying? Right. You could sit your ass home right here and read this book, and I'll give you that money that you was gonna get. You know what I mean? Right. I'm not personally. I'm I'm a jealous nigga. I don't <laughs> want my girl butt ass naked around men, especially. And this, as I said, they be around niggas enemies like this, holding sparkles up, bringing bringing bottles to you to the nigga <laughs> that want to kill you. You know what I mean? That was a Facebook status, wasn't it? At one point. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> like that was so good. Bringing bottles of people who want to kill you. So that's my whole thing. And I, and just like I said, I don't got no beef with the bars and the girls. I just be trying to bring knowledge to the table that if you present yourself a certain way, motherfuckers gonna act a certain way. So just like I said, I go to the I go to the bar, I go to the strip club or whatever. And my homegirls in there bartending, and there's chicks in there, and they like, tax you better give us some tips. So I'm giving them tips, and then I got mad ones. I already done got on my lap. Yeah, I'm good. I got like probably 200 ones left, and I'm sitting there and I'm watching them, and they like, you ain't gonna throw us no singles. I'm like, you ain't gonna twerk? You know what I mean? Yeah. So they like, you gonna make a like, yeah, twerk. So now I got three bartenders sitting there twerking. They looking just like the strippers. You understand what I'm saying? <laughs> and I'm like, I'm like, see, now this is what I'm talking about. I would be mad if somebody sent me the video of my girl twerking for them while they throwing money at you. Might as well be a stripper. Yeah. You understand what I'm saying? But the, that's the, the the lines is so close now. It's like of what a stripper and a bartender is in New York. I just like the fact that they know that you're popping as a podcast, so that's a good thing for the podcast community, that that they expect you to be throwing money as a podcast. Yeah, well, the hood, the hood, the hood, fuck with me, man. Bro, I bet you, can you walk down the street in Brooklyn without having to take pictures and shit? Nah, niggas in Brooklyn ain't trying to take pictures with nobody. They don't know you and all that. They'll give you a head nod, bro. Get really? Ice group, what up, nigga? Uh, like I'll shoot you, but they cool with you, <laughs> type <laughs> shit. But yeah, niggas know me. You know, but I always was popular and shit like that, and in, in the borough and shit like that. So like, niggas know me already. So the podcast shit just like amplified it, and really made people get to know me and shit. Like you always talking about you're broke though. Are you are you well on your way to not being broke because of this shit? Nah, I'm broke. I don't see. I don't know what rich is. Either the people, cause I've I know niggas in the hood to tell me they rich, and I'm I don't consider that rich. Yeah. So I I be always trying to tell people that I'm broke, like, um, shit. One of the first conversations I had with Jay Z, and I was sitting and I was like, yo, I'm broke, and I was like, we was talking about money, and, and, and he was like, me in too, America. And he basically, and I was like, and we were just basically talking. About, I was telling him how the middle class don't exist no more. And he mm. was like, yeah, that's crazy. Did you realize that it doesn't? Mm. And he was just breaking it down. And I was like, yeah, motherfuckers, I be saying I'm broke. And motherfuckers be like, you're not broke. And I be like, yes, the fuck I am. Yes, I am broke. Because if you go to the government right now and they look at your salary and they break it down, they're going to say, you're broke. You're going to be under the poverty right, line. Right. You understand right. what I'm saying? So how you going to tell me I'm not broke and you not broke and you not broke? You broke too. You just got a Benz. That's it. You broke. You know what I <laughs> mean? If it go down right now, all that shit gone. You yeah. know what I mean? So I just be trying to create that mindset. And this is another reason why niggas in the hood is dying. Because you got niggas who think other niggas are rich right. in the hood and they not rich. Yeah, and they post He got a couple shit, more yeah. dollars than you. Y'all share the same zip code. Yeah. Y'all share the same supermarket. It's, he ain't that richer than you. It's scary as fuck that like they really have to front with the guns and shit. Like young kids really feel like they need guns and money and drugs on fucking Instagram just to look a certain way. They're going to call that attention themselves. And it's also a part of defense mechanism. Yeah. You know what I mean? They they, they, they show their guns to people first so it'd be like, yo, don't run up on me. I'll be having guns. Right. You know what I mean? So it's like so much to coincide with the with the mentality and the hood that, that causes the demises of young niggas and shit like that. That's why I be saying the shit I say. Like, don't pump that to them. Yeah. Don't pump that. Don't pump that because a, 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 a new brain, you molded. Yeah. So whatever you molded it into, you creating this nigga. You creating the next old dog. You don't got to create the next old dog when you got... Tristan Walker's out here and like you know executives out here busting moves and all these fucking dudes doing dope shit. You, you know really what I mean? look up to him, huh? Nah, yeah, definitely. He's fucking one year older than me and raised thirty million dollars yeah. to do his company. Like I gotta shout respect out, he the shit legally. The like Razor God. To, and this guy like said like. When, when I started the podcast shit and really started making legal money, that shit was like the best feeling I ever had. Yeah. I never did that. Right. I don't know what it's like getting checks. Like, all the money I got, I got to watch over my, my neck for somebody, right. a rob or a police. Not to mention that, like, if you're selling drugs, like, you don't like selling drugs. It ain't fun to sit in the parking lot and wait for somebody for two hours or some shit. Mm-hmm. But meanwhile, like, you're doing something that you're passionate about that you believe in now. It's like, it's a whole different quality of life when you can actually just be yourself for a living, you know? Mm-hmm. That's, like, crazy shit. Like, you sit there and you get drunk and you talk and that's it. Definitely. It's beautiful. What about this conversations with Jay-Z? Somebody told me that you were going to interview Jay-Z. It didn't happen. What happened? Oh, no, nah, it wasn't like that. Like, I was in Manhattan and, um... Somebody texted me from Rock Nation and was like, yo, Hove up here. He want to meet you. And matter of fact, I was doing Vlad TV. Oh, okay. And I actually had my phone in the other room while I was taping. I came out, and that shit said like an hour and 45 minutes ago I got that text. So I'm like, oh, shit, I probably missed the nigga. He going already. Yeah. So then I wrote them back, and I was like, yo, 
I'm coming right now. I'm a couple blocks away. He was like, all right, he's here. So then I went up there, and we were chilling, and we was talking in the office. I actually forgot that I was even there to meet Jay-Z. Right. I was talking to him. We got in a deep convo, and I said something about a Jay-Z record. He was like, oh, shit, let me hit him. And he hit him, and then Hove walked in, like, man, regular, cool shit, you know what I mean? But he knew all about where you were coming from and shit. He was res- respectful yeah. of what you've accomplished he knew, so far. He knew so much, I was scared. Really? Yeah, I got nervous, like. I was like, why the fuck does he know this much? You know what I mean? Yeah. So, you know what I mean? He's a watcher. I be telling people. I was tweeting after that. I was like, man, just know whatever you're doing, Jay-Z is watching you. Really? So he actually is like paying attention to the culture like that hard still, even though nah, he ain't he's, out there. Jay-Z is embedded in the culture. He yeah. knows what's going on. He knows about the young guys. Like, when we were sitting there, like, he he was talking about Lil Uzi. Right. Like, he he brought up Lil Uzi in the conversation. I'm like, Lil Uzi? What the fuck you know about Lil Uzi? You <laughs> yeah. know what I mean? That's crazy. So, like, he's He's a watcher. He's embedded in the culture, like, and I think that's why he he maintains his status because he always knows what's going on. Right. You know what I mean? That's crazy. But like, uh, do you think that he will ever do your podcast? I don't know. Probably. He you should. Know? I don't know. It would be big for you. It would be big for Brooklyn. Like, a lot of kids in Brooklyn probably need a reminder about Jay-Z. Yeah. You know? They do. Yeah. They do. This is like a whole generation of people that don't even understand what Jay-Z means to us. Yeah. And they're young kids. You know what I mean? They was all born after after Juice came out. Right. You know what I mean? They don't know no better. (laughs) They don't know no better. I'm not even mad at them. We see it from a different perspective because of the Jay-Z versus Nas thing. Their favorite hood movie is is, is Baby Boy. So... (laughs) That's crazy. Hey, uh, you know, I got to ask you this question, and you can answer it as much or as little as you want, but what what went on with the the Troy Ave situation and everything out there? Man, I don't know what happened with that situation at all. Yeah, you can't really say anything? I I don't know what happened with it at all. Tax Stone, real real street dude. That's how you you answer a question like that. Anyway, man, I'm so thankful that you came on the podcast. Anything else that we should talk about before you uh, wrap this up? Nah, man. I don't want to. Man, it's fucking weed, man. (laughs) You can't wait to get involved with that? (laughs) I don't want to, but I I like the smoke, so I am going to do it. You got Dunzo off of Edible while you're out here, right? Nah, I can't fuck with no edibles, That's man. California for you. Everybody come out here and Last get time edible. I came out, I fucked with an edible. I ain't moved for a day and a half. And I ain't <laughs> fuck with them since. It just ain't for me. Yeah. You got to know what drugs ain't for you. I mean, <laughs> everybody wants to come out and eat a whole brownie. You can't really be eating a whole brownie if you That's what happens, because yeah. the shit be looking all cute and small. Motherfucker be like, yeah, I'm busting this shit down. And you think, oh, I smoke five blunts a day. I, I can eat a brownie? No, mm-hmm. it's a different, a very, very different thing. That's a fact. Next thing you know, you're dead. Hey, but for everybody out there, if you haven't listened to the Tax Stone podcast, find it on iTunes, SoundCloud. The dude kills it. One of the greatest hip-hop podcasts out there right now. And uh, shout-out to my man TK over here for Thank coming you, through. Man. Shout-out to Tax Stone. Peace. Thank you. Appreciate it. Be safe, though.